Okay, welcome to our first webinar, everybody. Our first speaker this year is David Cracky, who you can see on the screen. Thank you, Dave, for being here. Um, Dave, Dave has been an attorney with Nicholas Law since 1998, I believe. And he uh, specializes in lots of areas of the law, but in particular has a passion around brain injury and concussion and legal issues in those areas. So we're really honored to have Dave here to help us. Uh, he's also one of the folks who helped draft and pass our Maxis and Jenna's Law in Oregon. Um, so again, thank you, Dave, for being here. Uh, please let anybody know anything else you want them to know about you. And Dave's taken over. Melissa, thank you very much. Uh, to everyone watching, it's, uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, it's always a, uh, a good opportunity. I always appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss where Oregon is, where we have come from, and where we're going in the future. As uh, Melissa mentioned, I'm an attorney. been in private practice in Portland since 1990. Uh, I've been a partner at the Nichols Law Group in Portland since uh, 1998. I uh, was a member of the Brain Injury uh, Alliance of Oregon's Board of Directors right when Max's Law uh, was just kind of a conception. And since that time, uh, in about 2006, 2007, uh, we've come a long way in Oregon. My presentation today is entitled Head in the Game. It's a look at Oregon's concussion laws. Uh, the last few slides, however, are going to be focused on what we at uh, Siebert and OCAMP consider the most important emerging issue currently in Oregon, and that's the return to learn uh, protocols. What you know, We've done a really good job, I think, with regard to return to play, and that's what the bulk of this presentation is going to be about. But now we have an opportunity to really get in there and uh, make a difference uh, with regard to the kids who are concussed coming back into the school uh, room. So I uh, like to start this, it's a little lighthearted, uh, that we're always looking for proposed new legislation, we're always looking for new safety devices, ways to make things safer. Uh, it's been suggested, and in fact I saw this on a TED talk just this morning about concussions, that we should do everything possible to prevent concussions, and the question then becomes how far should we go? And uh, this is an actual uh, sport, at least uh, here in Portland. I think they call it bubble soccer or something. And it's a really effective way to avoid concussions. Uh, the reality, however, is that we just don't have, uh, <laughs> this is not practical. That being said, I want to mention the, the focus of the TED Talk that I was uh, listening to today is on a new bike helmet coming out. Uh, I believe it's a Swedish company. Which is chicken is and it essentially uh, uh, essentially is an airbag that inflates around the user when a, an impact is uh, suspected. There's a reality check though, and that is that concussions and especially second impact syndrome syndrome are no laughing matter. This is an older magazine cover now from Time Magazine. Uh, it's uh, a young kid in high school who passed away. And the ultimate question there presented is, is football worth it? Uh, it's a question that we all have to ask uh, since football is uh, the most, uh, uh, the sport that causes the most concussions among our youth at this point. Now, Max's Law uh, is named after uh, a young man in this picture here named Max Conrad. This is a picture of uh, Max, Governor Kulungoski, and myself at the signing ceremony. Max suffered second impact syndrome. Uh, he was the quarterback down at Waldport High School. He had a potential for a great life. He was a, uh, uh, on his way to Cornell. And unfortunately, at the time in 2002, uh, concussions and especially second impact syndrome were not on anybody's radar. And so when Max suffered his first concussion on a Friday night game, he was, let, he was allowed to play the following Friday. And uh, the game, footage, the film, uh, shows the hit that gave him the second concussion, and it's really a, a, a not a hit that anybody would turn their head at. It's, it doesn't look like a concussion force uh, impact. Unfortunately for Max, however, he lapsed into a coma for four months. He uh, basically went from a potential of going to an Ivy League school to a long-term care facility down in Salem. 
and uh, he currently, this is uh, uh, 15 years later, he uh, just got married. I just found out recently that his wife is pregnant. Uh, he has a relatively normal life at this point, but he still has very significant cognitive impairment. The lesson there is that second impact syndrome and concussions in uh, general are not to be taken lightly under any circumstances. Now everything may have just stayed the same if it weren't for Max's father. Ralph and Ralph uh, was a true proponent for his son and he kind of understood that something had to happen and that that something was education and specific concussion protocols. Max, uh, excuse me, Ralph uh, kind of hit a few brick walls. He finally got to the Brain Injury Association of Oregon, at which point we began the political process of establishing this new law. And if anyone has been actively involved in the political process, then you understand that it is complicated. You are building alliances. In this case, however, it was a relatively easy alliance to build. Uh, there wasn't a single legislator who voiced any kind of opposition to what ultimately became the educational component and requirements and the return to play protocols that are now known as Max's Law. Uh, we uh, did have to compromise a little bit. We wanted initially to have every young, uh, yeah, every youth sport, whether it was affiliated with a school or not, uh, covered by Max's Law. That was a, a political impracticality for something that was essentially new throughout the entire country. And so we compromised with school athletic teams. Um, at the same time, we were running parallel with uh, the state of Washington. Uh, Richard Adler up there, an attorney in Seattle, and the Washington, uh, or the Brain Injury Association of Washington, was working on a similar law based on a similarly tragic circumstance around a young um, man named Zach, a student named Zach. So we had Max's Law in Oregon and Zach's Law in uh, Washington that were unanimous. Uh, Washington's uh, governor signed their law first. Uh, we signed next. We're the first two states in the country to pass the mandatory concussion education for high school coaches. Max's Law in a nutshell, it's codified there, the number of the 336.485. That represents uh, the Oregon Revised Statute Law Number. So if anybody's interested, you can uh, Google ORS 336.485, and you'll get straight to the, uh, the text of the law. I have it in my materials as well. There are also what are called Oregon Administrative Rules, and these are a kind of a, a below-the-surface set of rules that more or less clarify what exactly is required by the statutory language. Uh, it talks about concussions, training of coaches, participation by athletes and rules governing that. It identifies a coach as any person who instructs or trains members on a school athletic team per the State Board of Education rule. That's important as we get further into what now is known as Jenna's Law where the State Board of Education is substituted out for a league uh, governing body. The Oregon Administrative Rules, or OARs, uh, the citation is there as well. It's that 10-digit uh, uh, number on the bottom. You can Google that as well, but I have those uh, OARs in this presentation as well. Max's Law requires that all coaches, and you'll remember from the previous slide that that is a broad definition, that they all receive annual training that allows them to recognize the signs and symptoms of concussions. It's designed to reduce, reduce the risk of concussions, to ensure that proper medical care is uh, received by the student who is concussed, and it also mandated that the State Board of Education shall establish by rule, this is, so this is a shall, uh, the requirements of the coach's training using community resources, those are more or less defined as, uh, in, as, as information available on websites, and that it established also the timing of that training uh, to occur before the season commences, and that's for obvious reasons. A concussion can occur at any time, whether it's in a practice or a game, and so you want to make sure that those people, in this case the coaches who have to know this information, know it before that risk accrues. 
with regard to the prohibitions, it, you know, the medical literature became obvious that we had to make sure that the coaches and law understood that when a student was concussed, that there were very uh, serious ramifications if that uh, student athlete was allowed to continue to participate. And so it basically said, or it specifically says, that a coach may not allow an athlete to participate in any athletic event or training on the same day that the athlete exhibits signs or behaviors consistent with a concussion following an observed or a suspected blow to the head or when that young athlete has been diagnosed with a concussion. The suspected blow to the head is important language. There's many times where all, especially in football, where all you hear or all you know about any type of a an impact is the sound that you hear. In fact, just this morning, I was in conference with a parent whose young seventh grader uh, was concussed in a game, a football game, a pop warner, which was a, another yeah. game. And all anybody knew was that this loud crack, this bam, happened that basically turned everybody's head toward where that loud sound came from. And it was a head to head, helmet to helmet impact that resulted in this uh, very obvious impact sound. So I would argue that that type of evidence would fall under the, quote, suspected blow to the head. Uh, making, in other words, you don't have to suspect, you just have to suspect that that occurred. Now, the coach may allow the member of a school athletic team who is prohibited from participating the athletic event or training due to the concussion, <laughs> that player participate no sooner <laughs> than after <laughs> the athlete experience <laughs> and only after the athlete goes in, no longer exhibits sign symptoms or behaviors consistent with the concussion. That's uh, <laughs> But also, that student must receive a medical release from a qualified health care professional. And those health care professionals are defined by statute. They include medical doctors, neurologists, uh, uh, athletic trainers, and, and others. But there are other types of medical professionals who are not currently authorized to provide that return to play authorization. And it's important that. Uh, that the medical release comes specifically from that individual. Now, I know that many of you listening are uh, athletic trainers or have medical backgrounds, and this uh, checklist of signs and behaviors and symptoms uh, is redundant or known to you, but it's important uh, for everybody to kind of understand when person, a uh, young athlete in this case, suffered. I don't think I need to go through uh, these lists just because uh, that's you know, unnecessary because they're right here in front of us all, David, but it's a lot of times common sense. David, I, I just need to interrupt for a second because we're getting a lot of background noise and I know that makes it hard for you to present and hard for others to hear. So if you guys have called in on the phone and you have background noise, there's no way for me to mute you. So you have to limit your background noise. And if you're on your computer and you are not um, muted, I need you to please mute yourself. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I'll help you with it, okay? Okay. I think we got it. Thanks, Sorry, Melissa. Not. I'm used to people talking over me, so that, that actually is fine. I have two daughters and a wife, so no, I'm only kidding. Uh, this is the, as I mentioned, this is the text of Max's Law. Uh, it is uh, there, obviously, for reference as well. I would urge everybody to read it. The law is, uh, is the law, and the ignorance of the law is no excuse. So if you have an obligation under Max's Law to act in a specific way, it's incumbent upon you to know what those actions are and what is required of you. This is the text of the OARs, uh, the Oregon uh, Administrative Rules, and I want to go to um, under 1 uh, C and then little d 
we have healthcare professional, and I do want to go through this list. It's a physician, an MD, a physician's assistant, a PA, an osteopath uh, licensed by the State Board of Medicine, or a nurse practitioner um, uh, licensed by the Oregon State Board of Nursing. Uh, so that those are the individuals who can uh, provide that return to play uh, uh, letter, which is very important. We were very excited, obviously, to pass Max's law. It was, uh, along with Washington, the first law in the country that required this kind of concussion protocol. It was truly a um, uh, kind of a, a culmination of everything that Ralph Conrad had pushed for, and I believe that it's uh, truly made a difference in terms of, number one, the recognition of concussions, and what has uh, what what goes on when a when a student athlete is concussed, it also swept the country, and ultimately all uh, ultimately all 50 states have passed a Max's Law equivalent. Uh, the last one about three years ago was passed, and so we're, we are really proud of the fact that this is the type of law. This is the, a law that all state legislators looked at, all policymakers looked at on a state-by-state -state basis, and all realized that they also need it. Uh, I consult regularly with legislators and policymakers from around the country. I just uh, uh, met a gentleman up at OHSU last week who I had worked with from Hawaii on uh, their uh, Max's Law, Jenna's Law equivalents. And it's always exciting for me when I, when I get a chance to talk to them. And it just emphasizes, the reason I'm dwelling on this a little bit, it just emphasizes how important these laws are and how important it is for citizens to kind of take the lead and make sure that the, uh, the government is keeping our kids safe with this. Also what was happening, very interestingly, and those of you who uh, are fans of the NFL who have seen the movie Concussion, you know that during the same time period from 2008 through 2011 or so, uh, things were really heating up in the NFL. And there, uh, right when we were passing Max's Law was the same time that the NFL came out with that infamous memo uh, basically indicating that there's no proof whatsoever that football leads to concussions, uh, certainly not to chronic traumatic encephalopathy either. And so this was a real terrible time of denial on the part of the NFL. It did have repercussion. There was a lot of political issue with regard to concerns that we're trying to make uh, football, trying to basically get rid of football, which uh, is not the case. We're merely trying to make it safe for those players and to allow those players to have an education as to what that game is doing potentially to them and when they become adults to make that decision to continue on playing the game or not with full understanding of the medical science behind it. Jenna's Law is the law named after Jenna Sneva, who I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But fundamentally what happened is we realized that with the political process we were able to get Max's Law passed, but it didn't cover the majority of athlete, young athletes in Oregon. And in fact what we had were numerous leagues out there, whether it was uh, uh, Portland Youth Soccer Association, the various uh, youth football leagues, uh, the CYO leagues, the United Way leagues, uh, basketball, soccer, football, baseball, you name it, every sport, uh, lacrosse, all of these sports where uh, uh, young athletes are at risk of concussion. And as I mentioned earlier, we had to do that for political purposes. We couldn't essentially bite the whole apple with Max's Law. So in 2011, uh, and actually 2012, uh, it dawned on me, well, I mean, it, it just became clear that we had to fill in that gap. And so that's what I did. I sat down at my desk and wrote out what became the first draft of Jenna's Law. I immediately called my friend, Dr. Chestnut, at OHSU. We worked on the draft of the law further. Uh, Jim and I then called uh, Senator Elizabeth Steiner Hayward, who was newly elected but also is a medical doctor. And we got to a, uh, had a meeting with uh, Senator Steiner Hayward. She instantly saw the need for Jenna's Law, and we uh, continued on with the passage of that. It wasn't as easy, I'll get into briefly, that it really wasn't as easy as you might expect. There were some issues that were raised. 
we, with Jenna's law, expanded it a bit uh, in terms of who is responsible for having this type of concussion education. We, of course, had cut coaches, which is the primary target in Max's law, but then we added referees, knowing full well that these referees are out there on the field. These aren't high school games. They're, you know, the kind of games you'll see at a, a local school, a, a local field somewhere with young kids anywhere from age 8, 9 up to age 18 uh, doing these non-school sports. We also included parents. We have a mandate in Jenna's law that one parent of each player is required to uh, per complete a concussion uh, recognition course, a concussion education course. The law is not exactly clear that that needs to be one of the very fine video courses that's available uh, through Siebert and through OCAMP or the CDC. In fact, the law, the way that it is drafted, indicates that it could probably be a series of printed written materials, uh, but if that were the case, those materials would need to be very expansive, in my belief, and with the uh, availability of these wonderful online courses, it's really, in my mind, something that, that that's where these uh, parents need to get their education. We also added athletes over the age of 12. We figured, and I think rightly so, that if these athletes are going to be playing this game and if they're 12 or over, a time, an age when, for the most part, they can at least understand what's going on and certainly when they get into 13, 14 and older, they definitely can understand it. We figured that it was really important to begin this concussion education early. In other words, let's educate the citizens of Oregon, these young athletes, to what to look for. We have a, a number of policy reasons why believe, we believe that was important and we, I still, uh, we, the team, still believes that's very important. Uh, what is going to happen is, is that these players are going to be required to take concussion training over and over and over again and eventually they're going to know this stuff like they know everything else that they know well and if they later on in life are in a situation where it's apparent that someone has suffered a concussion, at that time, I think that what uh, we'll see is that these now trained individuals are going to understand what they need to do to protect that uh, person that they're witnessing there at the time uh, from the potential for second impact syndrome and also for um, uh, obviously just to get the concussion treatment that they need at that time. Jenna's law has the same language about removal and return to play, gives the referee, it gives referees the same obligation to remove a player who has the signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with a concussion. And then as I mentioned earlier, lead governing bodies are substituted for the State Board of Education in adopting the concussion education requirements. Now, Jenna's law, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it almost didn't make it through the legislative process and it almost didn't do so based on liability concerns. And these were valid concerns. Uh, we passed the Senate uh, almost unanimously. We were on our way to the, uh, uh, to the uh, represented to the state uh, house, and I got a phone call uh, as I was driving down to the hearing that we expected was going to be really just, just uh, uh, pro form, I and mean, we just did not expect any opposition whatsoever. But all of a sudden, we were made aware that there was opposition. The opposition basically was that coaches in these lower leagues are just moms and dads. You know, they're just people who are volunteering to help their kids. They don't have specialized training. And the concern was, and I think it was a proper concern, that these moms and dads may find themselves liable for what could be very significant injuries. And that was uh, uh, accepted, you know, that was, that was understood to be unacceptable. And I agreed with that. It was not acceptable. That being said, we did not want to let these uh, coaches kind of off the hook, you know, with the, well, I just don't know any better. You know, I'm just a mom. I'm just a dad. I, I can't be expected to know this stuff. So we wanted to make sure that they still took this concussion education training. But what I had to do, and thanks to Mitch Greenlick, who was the chair of the committee in the House, he basically adjourned the committee before the bill got sent to the Rules Committee, which is at the time where, where it would have gone basically to die. 
and he gave uh, me a week to draft some liability uh, provisions and I drafted those provisions and basically uh, we limited regular coaches liability to cases of gross negligence or willful or wanton misconduct. Now just to kind of spell out what that means, it, it really wasn't a provision at all, if, uh, a, a, a kind of a concession at all, and here's why. The only way that I believe that you're going to be able to show that gross negligence, well there are a number of ways obviously, but for instance if there's a clear concussion and the coach leaves him in, uh, that in my mind is grossly negligent. But the thing that this really addresses is whether or not they do the training at all. Ultimately, we just want them to do this education training. We want them to be aware of what a concussion is, to understand what their responsibilities are in terms of recognizing, uh, removing, referring to a doctor, and then uh, not letting that player return until they have that clearance. And in a situation where that coach doesn't do the training, that to me would be the would be the evidence of gross negligence and or willful or wanton misconduct. So basically, while we provided the the larger organizations with this liability cover, uh, we are still basically in a situation where they are required to do this training, which is a great thing. Uh, we, however, did eliminate liability completely for a person who does not regularly serve as a coach or a referee. This situation, and for those of you with kids and uh, this not non-school uh, sports I know that this happens sometimes where a uh, game is scheduled to begin the coach is there the game can't continue without a coach being there and uh, sure enough somebody just kind of volunteers to be coach for the day uh, they haven't taken the concussion training perhaps and we wanted to make sure that you know there were plenty of other people from the other parents to the uh, referee to the other coach who could see what was going on. Uh, we wanted the game to continue, but we wanted to make sure that if a volunteer stepped up like that, did the right thing, that that volunteer was not personally liable for a tragedy that might occur on the field uh, based on a concussion. Uh, concussion uh, education, this is Jenna's Law is a sweeping concussion education law. Concussion education for every coach, as I mentioned. I'm going to go back to that for a second annual education as long as they're within the criteria and we haven't gotten to a firm number but we believe that the number of people in Oregon who are uh, required to get this annual concussion training is somewhere around 200,000 uh, per year it's in my mind it's really a great uh, example of public education this is uh, the text of Jenna's Law. I'm not going to go through that. We already have. Uh, this question has come up in a number of the presentations that I've given on this. What if the coach doesn't see it? Uh, I love the picture here with the two guys looking other ways. And we all know you have kids in youth sports. That happens. Coaches get distracted. And this was actually a concern that was brought up. So what if the coach doesn't see it but someone else tells the coach that they did see a hit or they do see signs, symptoms, player who is suffering sign symptoms and behaviors consistent with a concussion, what happens then? And in my opinion, this is only my opinion, there's no, been no case law on this uh, that I'm aware of, uh, if anyone tells the coach that a player has suffered a blow to the head or body or suspected of suffering that blow and that that player is exhibiting sign symptoms and behaviors consistent with a concussion, that coach must at that point remove that player from the game. It also just makes sense. You don't mess with concussions and you certainly don't mess with second impact syndrome. I don't think I've actually done a good job at the start of this. I usually spend more time on second impact syndrome. In layman's terms, that's how I'm going to, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm going to talk in layman's terms. When a kid's brain gets concussed, those brain cells, and this is the argument that I've used uh, to arbitrators and, and to just try to explain it, and please understand this is very layman's terms, those brain cells become like icicles, okay? They are very, you know, rigid, they're hanging from the eaves. Now, if you let the sun come out, in other words, if that player rests and goes through the appropriate concussion healing, 
It's as if the sun comes out, those icicles melt slowly, they drip down onto the ground, that water finds its way to the creek, the stream, the river, the ocean, back to the back to relatively normal. Now please understand I'm not uh, talking here about the concerns where there are lingering concerns from a concussion or the effects of multiple concussions. I'm just using this analogy to describe what happens with second impact syndrome. So in a normal circumstance where those icicles are allowed to melt, those brain cells are allowed to go back to a normal state through rest and healing, everything is generally okay. If, however, that player gets concussed a second time while those brain cells are in that icicle form, it's like taking a stick to those eaves, those icicles fall off, they smash to the ground, and that's essentially what happens in second impact syndrome. Those brain cells are gone forever. Second impact syndrome, it primarily affects adolescents, which is why this law uh, for under 18 athletes is so important. It has a 50% plus or minus mortality rate, meaning 50% of the kids who get second and who suffer second impact syndrome die. And it has close to a 90%, somewhere in 80 to 90% uh, morbidity rate, meaning that that 80 to 90 percent end up with long-term permanent nerve brain injury and that's what happened to Max Conrad and that's why it's so important for or at a time when someone tells a coach hey I think that this player suffered a concussion we saw the hit now they're walking around like they don't know where they are and they're falling over get them out of there because at that point that's when those brain cells again layman's terms are in that icicle state and if they get hit again even in that same game they are at the risk of second impact syndrome so again this is just a, a, a slide that clarifies what i just said it doesn't matter who sees it the coach is not the exclusive de uh, decider uh, Jenna's Law gives anybody, referees, I would argue parents, I would even argue with the other coach, and I would argue players, the obligation to say, hey, I think there's a problem here, and if that comes up, then that player is uh, required to come out. There was a big concern, I'll just mention this briefly, that other coaches, coaches would use Jenna's Law or Max's Law as a uh, competitive advantage. They would say, hey, I saw your star player get hit, Hey, I think he's now showing signs, symptoms, and behaviors consistent with concussion. Believe it or not, we actually had to address that particular issue as if that type of unscrupulous, low active, you know, coaching action would occur. I've never heard of it occurring. Uh, nonetheless, that threat is out there. We understand it's out there, but we've never heard of it actually happening. So finally, just to wrap this up, uh, the coaches do not have the exclusive ability or obligation to observe the hit. If they know that someone is out there with the signs, symptoms, and behaviors, they must bring that player out. School responsibility and liability, which is another reason why we're here, is that you know you have to the school district has to follow all requirements under Max's law. They should document the annual training. And if they suspect a concussion, take the player out. I'm going to breeze through these next slides quickly because uh, uh, this is a shortened program. In fact, I need to get through it much quicker. This, normally, this is an hour and 15 minutes, and I'm doing it in 45 minutes. So, Melissa, I'll speed it up. Uh, this is a lawsuit. Uh, I have the case law uh, citation there, and it's available for review. Basically, it was a, a situation where uh, a young kid played for Sherwood High School. He had prior concussions. He was concussed in September. He was taken off the active roster. He was, however, allowed back in without a healthcare professional. Uh, there was no trainer at the game. Uh, he was, in fact, concussed again, transferred to the hospital immediately. There was permanent brain injury. Pleadings, uh, basically they set forth why, they, why the plaintiff, in this case the player's family, believed that the uh, school district was responsible. Uh, we can go through them, but basically it's that they didn't follow the law, they allowed him to play when he should have been playing. That's, for the most part, in a nutshell, what was going on. That last one you'll see, they failed to have a concussion management team in place. Um, that's an important portion of the uh, uh, what a school district needs to do. Uh, there was a second 
claim, which is called negligence per se. That means negligence as a matter of law. And it basically, as you'll see in that paragraph 29, it goes through the language or the text of Max's law and says exactly why the school district failed to follow the requirements under Max's law. They prayed for or asked the jury for a, a huge amount of money, $841,000, and ultimately the case did settle and it kept settled uh, in an amount in a six-figure range. I, I, of course, did not handle that case. I don't do Max's law or Jenna's law cases. That would, that's just not what I do, but I know the attorney who did handle that case. Um, defenses, uh, no unreasonable conduct. There was a concussion protocol. Uh, there was discretionary immunity. And so why was there a case against the high school? And the answer is because the various concussion protocols were not followed. If you are listening to this and or watching this, and if you're with a school district in a position that where you can make sure this happens, make sure that you have a concussion protocol in place, that you follow it, and that you document the fact that you're following it. Document that in writing. This is an excerpt from the deposition of the athletic director. Do you agree ultimately that you're responsible for the decision to let the player return to play after a concussion as the athletic director answer yes. So it's really important that uh, everyone who's involved with that understand it. There are of course affirmative defenses, contributory negligence, improper venue, fault of others, um, failing to look out. In other words, that the, the plaintiff, the player failed to look out. I always get the question, well, what about the prior concussions? You know, which should he have even been playing? That, of course, comes into play. Now, reality check with regard to players themselves, and I think everybody who has a kid knows this, but they're not going to, the players aren't always going to disclose that they have concussions, concussion symptoms. They are going to kind of put on that scale in their own heads, you know, okay, yes, I'm pretty sure I have a concussion, but boy, do I want to play in that next game. You know, I need to be there. The team needs me. It's the championship game, whatever you want to say. Those kids are not always going to tell you when they have a concussion. That's all the more reason for the adults to step in. Uh, this next section is school district best practices. I always comment that this slide is clearly the Abercrombie and Fitch high school team. Uh, Got to be the uh, uh, most uh, model-esque athletes of all time. Uh, best practices. If a player had a previous concussion during the season, please take it seriously. That kind of obviously goes without saying. Don't let the player return if they are exhibiting signs and symptoms consistent with a concussion. That's obvious as well. Think of those icicles. It's still in that icicle stage. Require that medical release form from a healthcare professional before that player is allowed to return to play. Implement concussion education protocol for all coaches and athletic trainers. Uh, that complaint that we mentioned or that we just went through uh, alleged that the athletic training, uh, excuse me, athletic trainer was negligent as well. Educate the coaches. How, on how to recognize signs and symptoms, symptoms of a concussion. They should all know this now. But what we also are hearing through the grapevine now is that some schools are not doing this. If they are not doing this, that is gross negligence. That is a violation of law. And God forbid this should, you know, second impact syndrome or some other complicating factor should occur because Max's law is not followed. If that happens, that school and school district and coach are going to be in a lot of trouble in terms of any lawsuit that is brought. This presentation today is basically a way to eliminate liability for a school, and I'm giving you the keys here, how to do it. If you don't do it, you're not eliminating that liability. The goal here is all about keeping the kids safe. And that's why it's important that not only you have a concussion plan, the education occur, but also that everything is documented in writing that you have complied with Max's law. Create that written concussion management protocol. Uh, require that all coaches and trainers follow it. If a player suffers a concussion, document each case individually in writing and have administrative review and oversight. 
it's easy to get cynical. It's all the lawyer's fault. I know it. I hear that all the time. But let's remember why we're doing this, and this is to ensure the cognitive health of the players themselves. That's why we're doing this. That's why this law exists. We don't want any more maxes. We want healthy kids who are growing up with full cognitive health, and that's exactly what will happen if Max's law is followed. Establish the training timeline. Document it again. Establish a tracking system. Uh, determine who the athletic trainer works for and demand a conservative approach by that trainer. In other words, this is not loosey-goosey stuff. This is if there is a suspected concussion, sit them out. Number 14, when in doubt, sit that player out. Concussions are too serious. Second impact syndrome is devastating. Take it seriously. No game is worth the risk of long-term brain injury or worse. So I encourage everyone in the audience who is with a school, has the ability to kind of pursue these recommendations that, in fact, you do it. I've really blown through this quickly. I'm looking at my watch as we're speaking, and I know I'm running out of time, so I don't have really time to emphasize it any more than I already have. But just make sure that you know what's going on in your particular school and school district and that what you need to be doing under Max's law is being done. Now, this one is just that a statute does have legal effect. I won't get into the law here, but it basically means that, hey, ignorance of the law is no excuse. The law exists for a reason. Um, OCAMP guidelines should always control. We have a nice little just a, a, a mnemonic device here. Recognize that, there are con that a concussion may have happened. Remove that player immediately. Refer that player to an appropriate healthcare professional and return the player to the field only when cleared to do so by that healthcare professional. This is a, a slide that talks about a client of mine who uh, was injured with a, uh, by a, uh, a discus. It basically says the whole purpose of this is that a kid can get injured in any sport. Be aware of it. It can happen in gymnastics, obviously, football, soccer, basketball, baseball. If a concussion happens, just make sure that, uh, uh, that there is a proper protocol followed. Uh, this is a return to play protocol that Seabird has put out. Highly encourage everybody. It's got steps one through six, uh, steps actually one through seven. Uh, read this, please. We don't have time to go over it, uh, but it basically goes through the, especially the athletic trainers, it goes through the accepted medical response to a concussion in terms of returning that uh, student to play and to uh, a classroom. So our next challenge here, and I'm going to be really brief, unfortunately, on this, is return to learn. And uh, as the picture shows, you know, if a kid is concussed, that kid is going to have uh, difficulty going back to the classroom. Ultimately, the classroom is the most important, you know, field, if you will. Uh, much more important than an athletic field in my mind uh, because, you know, 99.999% of the students are going to uh, turn professional in something other than sports. And so we need to be aware of what's going on with a concussed uh, student and to make sure that that student is allowed to ease back into the academic uh, setting. Now, these slides, step one, step two, I believe step three, four, uh, kind of very simply simplify what's going on or what we are hoping happens. Uh, I know that many of you know that there are temporary accommodation plans uh, prior to a 504 plan, certainly prior to an IEP. Uh, and it's really important, and Melissa has done great work, people at, at uh, Siebert and Ocamp have done great work on establishing this return to learn protocol and it's just really important that when a concussion is suspected or when a concussion is diagnosed that not only the coaches step into gear and figure out what to do with returning to play but also the administrators and the teachers step in to make sure that that student is given the appropriate rest and accommodations to allow them to keep up with their classwork but not in a way that's going to make their concussion worse. And certainly if we're talking about the high school setting, there can be some very 
important milestones occurring at a time when a student may be recovering from a concussion, including standardized testing, SATs, uh, AP tests, uh, the whole bit. Um, these slides, I'm going to let you guys kind of read them on your own. You have the materials. Uh, I've added these next five slides or so uh, mm -hmm. as Siebert materials. Uh, please go through. The, the importance of this one is that most students, 80, 90 percent, are going to um, uh, recover within a few weeks. You're going to have five to 10 percent who don't recover uh, uh, within or recover within three, four, five weeks, and then you can have one to five percent who uh, require a much longer uh, process to recover. What uh, Seabird has done here is provided some really important uh, information about the type of concussion management team that a school can set up. On the left-hand side in the green boxes are the people, the individuals who will comprise that team. You can go through them, please do. It's very clear language. I want to pay attention, however, on this one to uh, the, the peer, uh, kind of the student, um, the student athlete. My experience with you know, young kids who have suffered concussions is that those peers are extremely important in their recovery. And if you have a, a peer, a student leader, or a, just a friend who is a student of that concussion student, if they can kind of step up and really let that kid know, that concussed uh, uh, student know that it's going to be okay. Those, kid, those concussed students are going through a really difficult time while they're recovering. A lot of this is, you know, they don't know what's going on, quite frankly. If they have a peer who is helping them, that really adds to that healing process. But that being said, all of these other individuals, especially the teachers, uh, become extremely important in that recovery. Create a concussion management plan. This should be something, and we're going to be working on this in the next year with uh, Seabird uh, to really try to nail this down, but we have some really good suggestions here. Uh, take time, please, to read this. Uh, this is a, an academic accommodations matrix, basically going down those, those uh, vertical columns. Please note there's a typo in this first sentence. Uh, where it says following concussion, students who receive academic accommodations, and it should say without, without penalty for missed work, are more successful and better, better able to reintegrate in school. So obviously we're not penalizing a kid who suffers a concussion. These are the accommodations and modifications, and obviously we're running out of time here, unfortunately, so I can't go through them all, but these are some really solid uh, uh, specific actions that a school can take with regard to the various kind of spheres that that concussed student finds him or herself in from the environment, from transitions from one class to another during lunch, the method of instruction, behavioral needs, because behavioral needs are really crucial at that point, assistive technology if available is uh, incredibly helpful. Uh, this is, again, additional issues that that concussed student is going to experience. Memory deficits, visual spatial deficits, the gross motor uh, de difficulties, attention, organization, curriculum fatigue, and on and on. Please take time. We're, we're out of time now. I'm actually over my time. Uh, so I just would please urge everybody to take a hard look at these uh, last few slides from Seabird. Uh, after a concussion, helping the student on the path to returning to learn uh, is our most important academic responsibility. That really is what this is all about. I am available for consultation. Uh, I uh, am on the board of OCAMP. I uh, am currently working with the Governor's Task Force on traumatic brain injury. Uh, got to have a lot of resources available and I'm able and willing to uh, help all of you with any questions that you might have. So that does it for my time. I thank you very much for uh, listening and watching. I really, more than that, though, hope that you implement uh, the various strategies that are in the PowerPoint presentation and we're, remember why we're all doing that, and that is for the students' cognitive future cognitive health. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave.
Um, we don't have we don't have any questions typed. So if anybody has any questions for Dave or myself at this time, um, get them typed in the box. I'm gonna actually stop our recording here, and uh, we'll stay live for questions. Thanks.